seen at five past midnight. Well, now on for the secret history of how a big change in Britain's currency turned small change into funny money. Thirty years ago, Britain underwent a seismic economic shift. It fell to the housewife's favourite to announce the news. This is the story of the moment when the pound changed forever. It's a story of high politics. It was, I think, the worst speech I made in 11 years in Parliament. And high finance. Can I ask you what it's like on the floor today? That's pretty chaotic. Of beleaguered housewives. And this is the new two penny piece. And what is, what is this worth in present money? You know? Yeah. And decimal dollies. And how much is that worth, the ten penny one? Well, that's the equivalent of our two shilling piece now. It's also a story of dogged resistance. It was rather like the tide coming in. And unlikely heroes. People felt extraordinary strongly about it. You know, for some people, it was the end of civilizations. They knew it. For some, D-Day was like a foreign invasion. When it came, they fought it not on the beaches, but on the high street. In Shoreham on the Sussex coast, the centre of resistance was a gents' outfitters. Owner Paul Plum refused to accept the new money. He had little doubt the country was right behind him. We had a lady phone up last week to want to know just where her shop was so she'd come over to, to because we were pro uh, registering a protest that was reflective of 90% of the population that are walking about today but just haven't got the guts to get up and say so that we don't want this thing. Plum's lone stand against decimalisation brought in sackloads of letters in which the Britain of pounds, shillings and pence spoke loud and clear. Dear sir, as you say, it's a lot of nonsense. What's the matter with the English people that we allow ourselves to be pushed around like this? For Plum and his supporters, decimalisation was nothing less than a conspiracy against Britishness. Dear Mr Plum, there is not the slightest need to alter our money and no call for it whatsoever from the public. But Harold Wilson, the little communist thug that he is, comes along and decided to turn everything upside down. Today, Plum enjoys spooling through his home movies of Shoreham from 40 years ago. They remind him of a time when Britain was a different country. Back then, you could buy your home for just £3,000. A pint was a shilling, or 5p in today's money, out of an average wage of £18 a week. But Plum's Britain was changing. People had never had it so good. A different world beckoned. In Whitehall, plans were afoot for a more modern nation. After more than a hundred years of debate, the men at the ministry agreed it was time for Britain to abandon the old LSD money, pounds, shillings and pence. Britain's economic rivals used decimal systems, 100 cents to the dollar, 100 pfennigs to the mark. But in Britain, there were 20 shillings to the pound, 12 pennies to the shilling, making 240 pennies to the pound. 
The pound system dated back quite literally to the Dark Ages, but had become an institution on which an empire had been built. By 1960, the days of empire were long over. Former colonies like South Africa were free to ditch LSD and join the modern world. In 1961, Harold Macmillan's conservative government declared that the time had finally come for the old country to catch up. Britain was to go decimal. Do you think that Britain should change over to the decimal coinage? Yes, I think it'd be better for the people in general, I mean. It'd be easier for changing. With all these farthings and half pennies. I think it should remain the way it is. It would be too confusing if they change it. Well, I don't think it's necessary. After all, every housewife knows 12 pennies make a shilling and 24 halfpennies make a shilling. Why should she have to make things complicated? Well, are you in favour then or against it? Well, I'm not against it. I'm not in favour. I mean... Just going to see which way the wind blows. Be careful, you know what I mean. No, I'm not in favour. I'm not against it. What do you think? Do you think that it's going to be easier for the housewife? Well, I'm asking you, I'm not a housewife, man. Now, now I can see you're not. <laughs> you wear the wrong suit. <laughs> The government appointed a special committee led by the eminent scientist and businessman Lord Halsbury to decide how the change should take place. It was then that one of decimalization's unsung heroes got the call. When the Treasury were looking for someone to help on Lord Halsbury's committee of inquiry, my name came up. Perhaps they didn't want to spare any of their own bright young things. Noel Moore wasn't traditional civil service material. The son of a stonemason, he grew up in a small Yorkshire town. He was in the graduate fast stream at the post office when he was invited to be secretary to the Halsbury Committee. He shared an office in the Treasury with his deputy, John Remington. Decimalization may have been a modern idea, but Whitehall preferred the old ways. The offices in the Treasury were pretty austere places. And in these rooms, there was a fire, a coal fire. But what there wasn't was a poker. Um, about twice a day, a little old man would come in, clutching the poker, uh, and he would poke the fire. He'd poke it at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he'd poke it at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and never otherwise could you poke the fire. Uh, and I suppose that was Treasury parsimony. The committee tackled just one issue, how to go decimal there were many options. Which would be best for Britain? The inquiry wasn't asked to state whether there should be a, a decimal currency or not. That decision had already been taken. It was just how to do it. I don't think everybody foresaw all the issues that would arise. In all, the committee considered 25 decimal systems. Two favorites emerged. In order to choose between them, the committee commissioned research from behavioural psychologist Dr Sheila Jones. Dr Jones, who was doing all the experiments on this, was an expert in what's called cognition. Uh, and cognition is all about how you can recognise, how quick you are on the uptake in recognising some new situation. Dr Jones recruited volunteer housewives to shop under lab conditions. She monitored them as they used the two systems. The results clearly showed one was the easiest to learn, the 10 shilling system. This system took nearly three times less long to master, which made it the preferred choice of consumer groups and retailers. The virtue of the 10 shilling system was its simplicity. The 20 shillings that made up the pound were halved. These 10 shillings were then each divided into 10 smaller units. 100 of these then became the new basic unit of the new money. So, two new units equaled one old pound. In come the dollars and in come the cents to replace the pound and the shillings and the pence. Be prepared, folks. When Australia decided to go decimal, it chose the 10 shilling system. It was simply the best choice for the consumer. But consumer needs cut no ice with the Bank of England and the Treasury. The system would mean scrapping the pound, a prospect which filled the pinstripe brigade with dread. The governor of the Bank of England came and spoke in fairly severe terms about um, the fact that uh, 
Uh, the pound was, first of all, a reserve currency, and secondly, it was traded all over the world. Uh, an awful lot of people who didn't fully understand currency transactions still understood that the pound was a symbol, a powerful thing, something in which they could rely, you see. As far as the Bank of England was concerned, Britain's international prestige and financial security depended on finding a decimal system that kept the pound. For the pound to survive decimalization, 240 pennies would have to become 100 new pence. That's when things got complicated. A new pence would be worth an awkward 2.4 old pennies. So an extra unit of currency, the half pence, would have to be introduced. But at least the pound would survive. The debate between pound versus 10 shillings lasted for a very long time, and it was really very fierce. People felt extraordinarily strongly about it. And for some people, it was the end of civilizations. They knew it. <laughs> so fierce was the argument that it split the Halsbury Committee. Their report failed to make a unanimous recommendation, and the Conservative government shelved the decimalization project altogether. Around 1963, the 1960s finally began. As hemlines climbed higher and higher, the Beatles became kings of the new pop world. For the first time in years, there was a Labour government in power with a Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who promised to modernise the nation. The Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated methods on either side of industry. Certainly decimalization was part of the idea of modernization. I mean, when before the Labour government came to power at that stage, Wilson made a great thing about the white heat of the technological revolution. When he came to power, he actually did damn all about it, but it was certainly part of the image that he projected. In 1966, Chancellor Jim Callaghan finally announced that Britain was to go decimal in four years' time. But he didn't say how, and the fierce debate over which system to use was reignited. One political party was all for the ten-shilling system and for scrapping the pound. The Conservatives. The ten-bob system was the best system. It was easier to have a transitional period where people were more familiar with the coins, there were fewer new coins. But the government felt that it was important to maintain the pound unit because of its international prestige. Since coming to power, Labour had been struggling to establish its economic credibility. It was having to defend sterling from attack by currency speculators. One answer was to devalue the pound, but the political consequences were unthinkable. You must remember that during all this time, we were battling, in effect, battling to save the pound. Uh, sterling was under pressure, remitted occasionally for a bit, but basically it was under pressure during uh, the, whole of, the whole of that time. Sir Sam Goldman was one of Callaghan's chief advisers at the Treasury. He was convinced that sterling would suffer if the new, as yet unnamed, 10-shilling unit was adopted. One of the uh, stumbling blocks that um, the protagonists of the 10 shillings uh, had to meet was what to call it. And there was a great de lot of debate about this. No one really could think of a, of a suitable um, name that would match the... Uh, pound sterling and its international significance and the role that, that it played. Some of the proposed names for the 10 shilling unit came straight out of the history books. Favourites were the noble and the royal. But whatever the name, opponents of the 10 shilling system were convinced that replacing the pound would be seen as a devaluation by the back door. What was wrong with the name the Royal? Everything. Well, what do you mean? It was a piece of nonsense to change, to go over from the pound to the Royal. That, that would really have led to riots in the street. What's in a name, though? Hmm? What's in a name? Well, you may ask that, but you haven't been involved in, um, in trying to 
sustain, run an international reserve currency. For me, the pound is a familiar unit as it is for 53 other million other people in this country. It's known throughout the world and there's no reason to change the pound unit uh, for any other purpose. The 1966 decimal currency white paper made it clear that Callaghan favoured keeping the pound. But he still had to win the argument in Parliament, where the 10 shilling system commanded strong support on both sides of the House. I thought the intellectual case for the 10 shilling unit was stronger. Um, I think probably uh, most of my colleagues in the Labour government and the Labour Party would have accepted the 10 shilling unit. The Conservatives, the opposition, were in favour of the 10 shilling unit. I think it would have been better, and we said so at the time, if the House of Commons and indeed the House of Lords had been able to make a decision on which unit we should have on a free vote. But once Callaghan had made up his mind with Wilson's support that we go for the pound, well, it became party policy, and as usual, when the whips are on, it doesn't matter what backbenchers think or what minor government junior ministers think, it goes through, and that's what happened. So the pound became the unit. Four months after the decision, disaster struck. Sterling took a nosedive on the international markets. What's it like on the floor today? What's it like on the floor today? That's a confusion at the moment. <laughs> Can I ask you what it's like on the floor today? That's pretty chaotic. In November, Callaghan conceded defeat and devalued. The myth of the pound was shattered, along with Labour's economic reputation. But decimalisation would go ahead anyway, and with a flawed system that some predicted would bring economic and social chaos.